You know, in that performance, you you didn't notice all of these things because you you don't know this, but there were just so many people in that that it was a miracle. We had one man in here that had been fighting multiple sclerosis and just a short period of time before that was totally healed. My granddaughter, uh, Jamie, in the video, walked right by her and you wouldn't have known which one that was, but she has the... the uh, dubious honor of being born a year after her father died. And he was raised from the dead and she was born as a result of that. We had some of the leading actors in there. One of the ladies that was a lead role in that, when she came here, she was in a wheelchair partially in and out and having all kinds of problems and she was a star in there. Uh, We had Timothy McDermott. We've got Deborah here. Stand up, Deborah. Deborah McDermott right here. And her two sons were healed of autism. She's South African, but she's married to an Englishman, and I saw them over in England, and they were both healed. And Timothy went to school in England, and then he came here for either two or three years, three years, and lived by himself here. Uh, a child that but prior to that had trouble getting out of the house and was just totally withdrawn. Autism. It was uh, Asperger's syndrome. And the younger brother, James, man, he was just at our meeting in England. And uh, Christopher, the husband, was there. And I tell you, the whole family has just been transformed. If you haven't seen that video about the healing of Timothy and James McDermott, you can go to our website and see that. I also saw Julianne over here dancing someplace. Where's Julianne Hartman? She's here. Where are you, Julianne? She was out there talking to somebody, wasn't she? But that's Julianne way up there. And, and Julianne had spent $300,000 on uh, doctors and was healed and And on and on we could go. If we got others, of course, uh, Ashley gave a little testimony about Hannah. Is there any others of our uh, healing journeys that are here, people that are here? Anybody? But we have, I think now, seven volumes and about, I think, five, four or five testimonies on each volume. And I tell you, God is just doing great, great miracles. Isn't that awesome? You know, there's so many people that when they talk about things like this, when they read that story about the woman touching the hem of Jesus' garment, that's something that happened 2,000 years ago. And they just don't believe that it happens today. Matter of fact, Jamie was reading something this afternoon that, uh, or I forgot exactly, anyway, we were talking about it this afternoon. And somebody was citing how that the early Christians laid hands on the sick and saw them recover by starting hospitals and coming up with medical things. And this is the way that they believe that God heals today. I'm not against doctors. If it hadn't been for doctors, all the Christians would have been dead. So I'm not against doctors, but I'm telling you, Jesus still heals supernaturally, miraculously today. Praise the Lord. And it is just so exciting what Jesus is doing. Man, it's awesome. I am so thankful. I tell you, I could just continue to sing and worship the Lord tonight and I'd be happy. That'd be awesome. I want to share some things with you. If you were here this morning, I started talking about the power of imagination and how that relates to your healing. That if you can't see yourself healed on the inside, you won't see it on the outside. And this is a major problem with most people because they see themselves sick, they think sick, they talk sick, and then they pray for healing. It just doesn't work that way. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And I shared some scriptures. I was talking a lot about this Hebrew word, Y-E-T-S-E-R, that is translated mind in Isaiah chapter 26, verse three, the Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him. But that same word was translated imagine or imaginations uh, five times in the Old Testament. And I gave some of those references and the actual definition of that Hebrew word means conception. Your imagination is your spiritual womb and you have to conceive things. 
And as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. That's talking about as you see things, not as you pray and beg and plead. And many times people will say, oh God, this is serious. And they'll tell God how bad it is. And they try and get God to move because of need. If the Lord moved because of need, things would be totally different than they are today. Some of the people who need the power of God the most uh, are the furthest from it. And God doesn't just move because your need is there. He moves through people who believe. Just like Ashley was giving testimony. That was such a great testimony about he didn't buy healing, but he needed to believe. And the scripture says in Luke chapter 16 that trusting God in the area of finances is the least use of your faith. If you can't do that which is least, you can't do that which is greatest. And there's people, there's probably people right here that you are desperate for a healing, but you, you're afraid to trust God in finances. You wouldn't dare give everything that's in your savings or that's in your checking account because you really do trust that. And yet you're believing for a healing. Did you know trusting God for finances is not near as important as healing? You can't buy healing. There's people that spend millions of dollars. There are billionaires that are dying because you can't buy healing. Healing is infinitely more important than finances. And if you can't do that, which is least, if you can't trust him in finances, then you can't trust him in something greater. So there's people here praying for a breakthrough and yet you've never trusted him in that area of finances. You need to do that. You need to conceive a miracle. And when he took that step of faith and gave those finances, that's not buying anything from God, but it was, it was trusting God. It was believing God. And I tell you what, that releases the supernatural power of God. God is a good God that wants us all to prosper. His will for every one of us is prosperity. Third John chapter one, verse two, beloved, I wish above all things, above all things, that's above all things. In the Greek, that means all things. <laughs> he wishes above all things that you might prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. God wants to prosper you. God wants it more than you want it, but we block it through our doubt, through our fear. And so you have to get out of that place of fear and doubt and worry and start taking a step of faith. And again, it starts with finances. I could nearly preach on finances, but I've talked about all of those things. What I want to do, if what I was saying this morning was true, and if your imagination was so strong that the Lord had to come down and confuse the languages at the Tower of Babel to stop people from imagining and doing things. If imagination is that powerful, how come all of the references to imagination in the Bible are negative. I dealt with this for a couple of years, praying, God, why is this? And I used a number of scriptures this morning. Let me use one more over in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 tonight and read this to you. This is a New Testament scripture about your imagination. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and in verse 3 it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Did you know our spiritual weapons, people will teach that, man, the devil is this huge force and Satan is fighting against us and you've got to intercede and bind and do a all of this stuff. I believe Satan is real. I believe he exists. I believe he is at going about seeking whom he may devour, uh, devour. But exactly as Carly said this morning, his only power that he has is deception. He is a defeated foe. He doesn't have the power to make you sick to do anything unless you believe it. He has to have your cooperation to do anything. Thank you for that thunderous silence. <laughs> Most people don't believe that because oh, I didn't believe for this. I, I didn't ask for this cancer. I didn't cooperate. I wasn't out living in sin. I wasn't doing anything. 
Cancer just came at me. I didn't have anything to do with it. Yeah, you did. If nothing else, you bought the lie that you're only human. And then after all, cancer and these kind of things happen. And what can you do? I mean, it's incurable and oh God, help me. And the moment you come to God and say, God, I can't do anything. The doctor says, I'm dying. You cooperated with the devil. That's right. The Bible says that no plague will come nigh your dwelling. But it says there in Psalms chapter 91, it says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him will I trust. You have to say it. The power of God is voice activated. God created the heavens and the earth by words. He spoke everything that's physical into existence. And even the germs and even the viruses and things that have been corrupted since the fall of man and now they're destructive, those things were created by words. They will respond to words. And you have to speak words. And when you say, oh God, I am nothing. I have nothing and I can do nothing, but we know that you can do all things. God, would you stretch forth your hand and heal? You cooperated with the devil. You are believing that you're powerless. And people will say, well, it says in John chapter 15, verse five, Jesus was speaking and he said, without me, you can do nothing. Well, that's absolutely true. I agree with that 100%. Without Jesus, I'm a zero with the rim knocked off. I am nothing, but I'm never without Jesus. He's never going to leave me nor forsake me. And so even though I in myself am nothing, I in Christ am awesome. I'm greater than any sickness or any disease. And the moment you start praying and saying, oh God, we're just powerless. The doctor says it's incurable. There's nothing we can do. You cooperated with the devil. You may not realize it, but you have. You have believed a lie. You believe that sickness, paralysis, disease is bigger than you. There's nothing I can do about it. That's a lie. That's right. Amen. 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 I know that there's many people, I don't have anything, I didn't have anything to do with this. I can guarantee you, Satan can't do anything to you without your consent and cooperation. You have to believe a lie somewhere. If you were walking in the fullness of the power of God and if you were appropriating everything he had done for you, I guarantee you no plague would come nigh your dwelling. But see, you've got to see this. And so anyway, I got off on that by saying people are rebuking the devil and fighting demons and stuff and they do exist. I'm not saying they don't exist, but they have to have your cooperation. This is why that man that was demon possessed, his demons were called legion. Those demons begged the Lord to let them enter into the swine because a pig has more authority than the devil. The devil doesn't have a physical body. Only people with physical bodies have authority in this earth. And so Satan has to gain some cooperation. He, you know, a, 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 a caterpillar, slime has more authority than the devil. It's got a body. It can do something. That's the reason Satan has to inhabit a demon. If it was just up to the devil, he goes about seeking whom he may devour, but he cannot devour everybody. If it was up to the devil, every one of us would be dying. Every one of us would be paralyzed. Every one of us would have a death sentence, but he can't have everybody because you have to cooperate. And it's not always because you're out there sinning or saying, devil, I love you, come fight me, <laughs> come devour me. That's not what you're doing, but you have believed a lie that you're only human, that there's nothing you can do. The doctor says it's incurable, so what can I do? You could believe God. You could begin to start renewing your mind and find out who you are and take your authority and speak to that devil and command it to leave. Some of you think, but mine isn't a devil. It's just something physical. Anyway. <laughs> Our spiritual weapons, what are they used for? To cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's another thing that see most people have just given their thoughts over to the devil. They don't think you can keep your mind stayed upon God. 
But I've already quoted that verse once, Isaiah 26, 3, the Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him. That's talking about your imagination, who you are taking the word of God and thinking on it until it paints a picture of you of victory, of authority, of control over the devil that's coming against you. And when you think that way and keep your mind stayed upon him, not just, you know, the Bible says that just live by faith. They don't visit there. They don't vacation at faith. This is where they live. You live by faith. You can bring every thought into captivity and under obedience to Christ. You don't have to have these negative thoughts. You can't necessarily keep a negative thought from coming. Kenneth Hagin used to say it this way. You can't keep a bird from flying over your head, but you can keep him from landing and making a nest in your hair. You can't necessarily keep negative thoughts from coming because we live in a fallen world and you're going to hear a bunch of negative stuff, but you can take every thought captive and in obedience to Christ. And there's many people, I would say the vast majority of Christians do not believe that's possible. It's not even a goal. And you willingly play, pay hundreds of dollars a month to have unbelief and doubt and adultery and murder and bad news piped into your home and you spend every available moment on the telephone watching and learning all of this stuff and we wonder why we don't want to keep our minds stayed upon God. It's not even a goal for most people. Most people don't even believe it. You know, if that's what you're doing, then you have unwillingly maybe, but you have cooperated with the devil and that's giving him place. One of the reasons I believe Adam and Eve lived to be 930 years old is because they didn't know how to be sick. They didn't have somebody telling them, it's flu season. <laughs> have you got your flu shot yet? And so they had fear and started planning, oh man, I got to watch it or I'll catch the flu. They didn't know about the flu. They didn't know that when you were over 30 or 40 that you were over the hill and nobody gave them black balloons and started... <laughs> giving them depends and talking about you're going to need these and preparation H and stuff like that. They didn't know about these things. It took the devil 930 years to convince them about how to die. They didn't know how to die. We've been taught how to die. We've been taught how to speak death. We've been taught how to expect it. Whether you realize it or not, that's cooperating with the devil. This is not the way God made you to be. God did not make you to be sick. Amen. By the stripes of Jesus, you are healed. We've heard that a hundred times already. And yet the average Christian has been prepared for sickness and defeat. So here's a negative use of your imaginations. If imagination is this powerful, how come... It's not talked about in a positive way. I asked that question for a long time. And then one day I was just reading over here in Romans chapter 8. Let me turn over and read this to you. And remember that the definition of an imagination, according to the dictionary, it's the ability to see what isn't real or present. It's either something that's, that's real, but you can't see it. It's removed from you. Or it's something that hasn't come into being yet, like these buildings. I saw these buildings before they were here. They were in my imagination. So that's the definition of imagination, according to the dictionary, is the ability to see something that's not real or present. And one day I was just reading in Romans chapter 8. And in verse 24, it says, we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. And I was just meditating on that and thinking about it. And all of a sudden it dawned on me. Hope is seeing something that you can't see, which is the definition of imagination. And I believe that the Bible calls a positive imagination hope. And so, man, that just opened up all kinds of things to me. Imagination is always spoken of in a negative way. The only, uh, the only use of imagination that wasn't just totally negative is 1 Chronicles 29, 18. We read that this morning. And that's where David prayed to keep this forever in the thoughts of the imagination of his hearts, of their hearts. And that was talking about your memory. But other than that, 
it says that the thoughts of man's hearts were only, the imagination of the thoughts of man's heart were only evil continually. That Luke 1, 51, that he's going to take them in the imagination, destroy them in the imagination of their own hearts. So imagination is used primarily to describe a negative imagination, but a positive imagination is what the Bible calls hope. And this is what Daniel and Carly were talking about this morning. They got off on this. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. I'm going to say some of these things very quickly because I got a ways to go. But Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Substance is talking about something that is tangible, that's real. This pulpit has substance. And so faith gives substance, tangibility to things hoped for. And that's talking about your imagination. If you don't have it in your imagination, faith doesn't have anything to give substance to. And Daniel and Carly touched on this this morning, but most people give hope a bad rap. Like people say, are you, you know, are you believing God for healing? Well, I hope so. And they say, well, don't, don't hope so, believe. But you know, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3, now about a faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Hope is mentioned right there in between faith and love. It's one of the big three. It's a powerful force. Hope isn't the end result, but it is a necessary step along the way. Charles Capps, I heard him teach on this one time, and he gave a story about a guy who lived in the backwoods someplace, and he only came out every few years to get supplies. And he came out and he went to a church service and there was a lot of people in the church and they, it started getting hot and he started fanning himself. And about that time, one of the ushers came up and turned this thing on the wall. And when he turned it within just a minute or so, this guy started feeling cold air blow on him. And he, he, he forgot everything else. He couldn't even listen to the message because he was just so impressed with this cold air blowing. And so as soon as the service was over, he went up to that usher and he says, what was that thing on the wall that you touched? And he says, well, that's a thermostat. And he says, that's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. You turn that and cold air started blowing. And he says, can anybody get a thermostat? And he said, well, sure. And he says, where do I get a thermostat? And he says, you can get them at the hardware store. So before he went back to his cabin in the woods, he went and bought a thermostat. <laughs> And he put it on the wall. And when it started getting hot, he went over there and turned that thermostat thinking that it would blow cold air and nothing happened because the thermostat doesn't blow the cold air. It controls the power unit, the air conditioner that produces the cold air. But that with, without that thermostat, the uh, power unit is useless. Well, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Faith is powerful, but hope is what activates faith. And I tell you, once you get a hope, I wish I had better words to say this. I'd, it's one of those things that it's easier caught than it is taught. But once you, once you get a hope, once you meditate on something, you pray and all of a sudden you see it. Again, I wished I could say this better. I'm asking the Holy Spirit to help you understand this because there's many of you that have squelched your imagination for so long that it's hard for you to relate to what I'm saying. But once you pray about something, meditate on it, and all of a sudden God speaks a word to you and you see it. You know God has spoken to you. I guarantee you once that happens, faith will kick in like that. You will find some way to make, bring this thing. Faith will give substance to things hoped for and evidence, physical proof to things not seen. It didn't say things that don't exist. They do exist, but they exist in the spiritual realm. But it will give substance to things hoped for and evidence to things not seen. You know, Jamie and I went to look at a car one time. We just needed a car and we didn't have money for a car, but we knew we needed one. So we thought we're going to go to a dealership and just look at a car. It wasn't emotional. We, we had a dog of a car. It needed to be replaced. 
And so we just thought we we're going to start the process. And we went down there and we told the salesman we don't want to do anything except just get some information. How much is it going to cost? How much do I need to believe for? And what's the, you know, uh, what, what are we looking at? What kind of cars in our price range? And so that's what we were going to do. But when we went there, these salesmen know the power of imagination. <laughs> and this salesman said, oh, no, you don't just want <laughs> information. Go sit in the car. I said, I don't want to sit in the car. I just want some information. He wouldn't give me anything until I went and sat in the car. And then he says, man, doesn't that smell good? Doesn't that feel good? And then can't you see yourself driving this car? And then he says, let's drive it around the block. And I said, no, I don't want to drive it around the block. And he says, no, I want you to drive it around the block. So I drove it around the block and compared to our car that had all kinds of noise and rattles and, and it was the shocks were bad and everything else. This one was smooth. And did you know I saw myself in that car? <laughs> And anyway, I had enough self-control to tell this guy no, and we went home. I didn't make any commitments, but I stayed up half of the night thinking, how can I do this? How can I make this happen? Once I saw myself in it, boy, all of a sudden, my creative juices started flowing. And see, that's what happens. When, once you see something, once you can get it in your imagination, I guarantee you, it's just a matter of time until you will see it and touch it. But the problem is most people are praying for something that they've never conceived, that they don't see. You don't see yourself well. You don't see yourself the victor. You see yourself the victim. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. I pray with lots of people, thousands and thousands of people, and I would say that the majority of people come up and say something to the effect of, could you please pay, and they get pitiful, hoping that that'll touch my emotions. Would you please pray for me? The doctor says I'm going to die, and I've got three children, and I've got this, and what. And they start, and what they, this is how they see themselves. I'm nothing. I have no power. I even had one man come to me uh, just a month or two ago and he says, I know what you're saying and I know that by the stripes of Jesus I was healed. I know what the Bible says. I believe what you're saying, but I just don't have any power. And you know, the first thing I said to him is Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of your tongue. You got power right here, but you're using it to kill yourself by saying you don't have power. You're hung by your tongue. You need to start speaking the word. But see, most people come in some form of, I'm desperate, I don't have any power, would you please do something? The moment you approach God like that or approach any of his messengers like that, you have just cooperated with the devil. You are seeing yourself as a loser. That's how you see yourself. And then you wonder why you lose. You wonder why you're still sick, why you still have these problems. You don't see yourself well. You don't talk well. You don't think well. Amen or oh me. We're saved by hope. And the word saved here, Greek word sozo, it's not only talking about forgiveness of sins, but it's talking about healing. Healing is a part of your salvation. You have been forgiven of sins, but you've also been healed just as much as you were forgiven of sins. I'm going to say something right now that the vast majority of people don't get and they misunderstand, but that's your problem, not mine. <laughs> but you know what? I believe I am redeemed from sickness as much as I'm redeemed from sin. I fight sickness as much as I fight sin. I wouldn't have a cold. I wouldn't get sick any more than I'd commit adultery. I won't do it. And some, why oh, I don't have any control over that. You just cooperated with the devil <laughs> by thinking that. Oh, I can't control whether I get a cold or not. Yes, you can. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I know many of you think this is just totally weird, but you know what? It's been 50 years since sickness is one in my life. 
I've, I've had some sickness try and knock on my door. I was making radio one time and had the flu attack me right in the middle of a radio program. And I started having aches and chills and I stopped for about 30 minutes and prayed in tongues and got over it and went back and finished up the deal. I've had sickness fight me, but I had, sickness hadn't won in my life in 50 years. I don't get sick. I don't believe in getting sick. I will not get sick. You can't make me sick. <laughs> And many of you are saying, well, that's not true. You can't live that way. That's the reason you're sick. <laughs> as long as you can be sick, you will be sick. But when you get sick and tired of being sick and said, I will not do this because Jesus has purchased it and I've got authority and power, death and life are in the power of my tongue and I'm going to walk in healing. When you get to that place, then it's just like Psalms 91. No plague will come nigh thy dwelling. Only with your eyes will you see and behold the reward of the wicked. A thousand will fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come nigh you. That's the promises of God. But did you know all of those promises in Psalms chapter 91? It says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. It's voice activated. The power of God is voice activated. You got to start speaking this. You got to start saying that by his stripes I'm healed. I refuse this sickness. You got to fight against it. Let's turn over to the scriptures that I think it was Daniel was using this this morning, or Carly, anyways, one of the two or both of them. In uh, Romans chapter 4 and in verse 17, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before whom he, him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they are. Did you know that this is a quotation from the Old Testament when it says that he calls things that be not as though they were. And what he's talking about is Abraham's name originally was Abram, which meant exalted or mighty father. And he says, I'm changing your name from Abram from being an exalted father to being Abraham, the father of many nations, because a father of many nations have I made you already done past tense. That was 26 years before Isaac came along. And God called him a father of many nations 26 years before he had a child. And that's what it's referring to. God calls those things that be not as though they were. He spoke it into existence. And then in verse 18, talking about Abraham, who against hope believed in hope. There was no hope in the natural. In the natural, he was 99 years old when the Lord appeared to him finally in the 18th chapter of Genesis and told him this time in the next year, your wife will conceive and have a child. He was 99 years old and Sarah was 90 years old. And the scripture says it had ceased to be with her after the manner of women. She had been through menopause. It was impossible for her to have a child. And so in the natural, there was no hope, but he, against hope, against all of the odds, he believed in hope. And hope, what is hope? It's a positive imagination. He had a vision of having a child in his old age. And that's the reason, I think again, Carly and Ashley mentioned this this morning, but this is the reason that God says, count the stars in the sky or number the grains of sand on the seashore. If you can count them, so shall your seed be. That's how numerous your descendants are going to be. And I believe that the reason God gave him those is because it helped him to see. It helped his imagination. Every day, he didn't have boots like I do. He had to walk in sandals and he got dirt on his feet. And every day he had to clean the dust and the grains of sand off of his feet. Every night, they didn't have a building like this. They sat out under the stars and every night he saw the stars. So day and night for 26 years, every time he looked up there, it was so shall my seed be. Every time he looked at the grains of sand, so shall my seed be. For 26 years, he conceived this. That's the reason God did this. He gave him something that he could see. This is the reason the Bible says don't take away landmarks. There are scriptures about it's, a, it's forbidden. You could be punished by death if you take away your neighbor's landmarks because we need to have landmarks. We need to remember things. 
I've got a rock that's that tall and about this big. It weighs over a ton that rolled over my head. And I got a landmark, a, a thing right there where I wrote the scripture down out of Psalms that says, the Lord preserves the simple. And uh, I said, God saved my life when this rock rolled over my hand, arm and head. And it was right before I started on television. It was 1999. And I've got that. And every time I walk down that trail, I see that. And I remember, Jesus, you got a purpose for my life. You kept me from dying. And I've got these memories. We need to imagine things. We need to remember things. We need a vision of where you're going. If I was to ask most of you in here to write down your vision for your life, there's many of you that have a wish list. You wish you would have more money. You wish you could do something, start your own business or do things. But what do you really see for your life? I've done this in other services and over, usually over 80% of the people in a service like this don't have a clear direction for your life. You're just doing what circumstances you had to have a job and so you got a job, it's paying your bills and so you're doing it, but many of you hate what you're doing. Man, you get up on Monday and talk about Blue Monday and then on Friday, TGIF. Man, if you're excited about taking the week off, it's because you haven't found what God's called you to do. Man, I love what I'm doing. I actually had, I walked through the break room one day and one young guy was going TGIF. And I said, what does that mean? He said, thank God it's Friday. And I said, what's so great about Friday? He says, I don't have to work tomorrow. And I said, I can fix it so you don't have to work any days. <laughs> I said, do you not like working here? And he goes, oh no, I like it here. And I said, well, then why are you so excited about getting off of work? And boy, he started backpedaling and... <laughs> Anyway, he doesn't work for me anymore. <laughs> but I'm telling you, if that's the way that you are, and if, you're, if it's a drag and it's a burden on you to go to work, you have not found what God's will for your life is yet. And there's many people that just work a job because, well, I've got to do it. And I don't know. I just put in a want, I answered a want ad and this is what happened. But you don't know that God called you to do that. You know, this is not a dress rehearsal. You're burning daylight. And if you aren't, if you don't know what God has called you to do, or if you don't have some direction and are pursuing that, waiting on further instructions, then you're wasting time. If you aren't living on the edge, you're taking up too much space. You need to be out there doing what God called you to do. And let me just put in a plug for Karis Bible College. This is what it's all about. There's a lot of people that know that there's more than what they're experiencing. They don't know what it is, but they, there's got to be more to life than what I'm experiencing. And they figure that God is the answer and they figure it's in the word. And so they come to Bible college. And I tell you, we have thousands and thousands of people that discover what God's will for their life is. And it takes on meaning and it just totally transforms your life. Man, if you don't know for sure what God called you to do, I'd recommend Karis. It'll, it'll change your life. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I have people say, well, if I, if I could just do what I wanted to do, I would come. I'd come to Karis Bible College, but I'm just not sure it's God. And so I tell people all the time, I say, well, I understand what you're saying. It might be the devil that wants you to come sit under the word four hours a day, five days a week for two or three years, or that might be your flesh. This sounds like the devil, like just the flesh that you want to come to school. You know what? If you got a desire, guess what? God put the desire there. You need to satisfy it. We've got all kinds of ways. We've got an e carriage that you can take out there and get an iPad and the whole first year is loaded on there. You don't even have to have an internet connection. And anyway, good things. So why did I get off on that? But it was good. <laughs> you got to have a vision for your life. That's what I was talking about. Thank you, Greg. And so most people don't have a vision for their life. They're just like on a treadmill and they're just going and they don't know where they're going. They're going nowhere. 
Boy, that's, that's a wasted life. God's never made a piece of junk. God has never made you to just occupy space. God has never made anybody to just go through life and then when you die, nobody misses you. You didn't touch anybody. You didn't do anything. I'm not saying this to condemn you. I know many people, oh, I don't want to think about that. Well, the only time you can do anything about it is now. After you're dead and gone, it's too late. So you need to deal with it now. It may not be pleasant, but I'm telling you, you need to know what God's purpose for your life is. I was born for such a time as this. I know I'm where God told me to be. You know, I went and spoke one time at a, a guy who was a partner of mine and he had 30, 40 employees and he asked me to come in and speak to him. And so I spoke to him, saw some people born again, saw some great things happen. And when I walked out, there was a new lady, an oriental lady that was sitting at the reception desk. And I said, you weren't back there with the rest. And she said, no, I'm the new kid on the block. And they wanted me to answer the phones while everybody was in the back. And she said, who are you? So I told her my name. She says, what do you do? And I said, I'm a minister. And boy, her eyes got big and she said, for who? And I said, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And she says, you're the one. And I said, the one what? And she told me that she was a Buddhist. And the night before she was going through all of her rituals that she goes through and she just stopped in the middle of it. And she says, God, this can't be it. She says, I know that there is a God. I know that you exist, but this can't be it. Who are you? Reveal yourself. And she said a ball of light came in front of her and it was pulsating and she heard an audible voice saying, tomorrow I'll send you a man who will tell you who I am. And she said, you're the man. And I said, I am the man, praise God. And I got to lead her. I led her into salvation, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that was great to see what God did for her. But when I went and sat in the car, I couldn't even start the car up. I just sat there praising God, thinking, God, I was in the right place at the right time. I was in the perfect center of God's will. And that feeling is amazing. To know that you're exactly where God wants you to be. And brothers and sisters, I love you, but there's some of you that have never had that. You don't know. You're hoping so. You hope that your life is going for something, but you aren't in the driver's seat. You're just in the back seat along for the ride. You aren't controlling anything. Man, that'll kill you. That's not what God intended. So I forgot I got up on all that. But God, you got to have a vision for your life. And so he had a vision. He knew that he was going to have a child and he had been waiting. And even though he was near, he was a hundred years old when Isaac was born, he had a vision. And look at this. It says, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. That is a quotation from Genesis chapter 15 where he says, count the stars in the sky. If you can number them, so shall your seed be. Five words. Abraham believed God with five words. We've got millions of words. But the word painted a picture. If you can count the stars, if you can count the grains of sand, so shall your seed be. The word of God sparked his imagination. This is the difference between fantasy and imagination. Imagination, godly imagination, is based on the word of God. You let the word paint a picture. Man, I got so much I want to say. Put a little comma here. I'm going to come right back to this. And I'm not going to turn over there lest I stop and preach on it. But in Psalms chapter one, verse two, it says, the godly man who is blessed, his meditation is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Then in Psalms chapter two, verse one, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The word imagine in Psalms chapter two, verse one, and the word uh, meditate in Psalms one, two is the exact same Hebrew word. You can't meditate without imagining Meditation in the word is when you read the word, you take that information, but then you close the book 
and you wait until those words form a picture, until it affects your imagination. This is why when people go to Israel, they come back and they say, oh, the Bible just came alive. There's such an anointing on that place. Man, everything was awesome. There isn't a greater anointing in Israel than there is right here. You know what happens in Israel? Things that you've read about, but you didn't meditate until it formed an image. Now you can go over there and all of a sudden you see these places and it sparks your imagination. I took a tour to Israel and when they went down to the Valley of Elah where David fought Goliath, it was a hot day and the bus parked on the side of the road and there's nothing there. And for miles, it's just open. It's very similar to the way it was in David's time. And the tour guide said, this is where David fought Goliath right here. Does anybody want to get out? And it was a hot day, so nobody wanted to get out but me. And I got out and made them all wait. And I walked down to this dry, to this dry riverbed or stream, and I got five smooth stones. And I stood there and held those stones and looked around on the mountains and thought about what would it be like to fight Goliath? You know what? I was seeing it. I imagined it. It quickened my imagination and that became real to me. And I've got a whole series that I taught about David because I didn't just read the words, but I read it and I saw it. And then I saw myself fighting my Goliaths, my giants. See, there's people that will read it and you could tell me what David did and how it worked for him, but you've never seen yourself slaying the giant. That's your imagination. That's how you meditate in the Word. You, have to, you can't meditate what you haven't read, so yes, you have to read and you have to study and you have to put the information in, but then you need to sit there and see these things coming to pass. If the Bible says greater is he, than he that's in you than he that's in the world, have you ever seen yourself greater than the devil, greater than the problems that you're facing? Or do you see yourself overcome and do you come up to somebody and oh, I'm in such a bad shape. I'm going to die if the Lord doesn't. That's not seeing yourself greater than the problems that you're facing. Many people can quote the scripture, but they don't see it. You've got to see it. So Abraham saw it. And it says in the next verse, and be not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. The word consider, if you look it up in the dictionary, it means to study, ponder, deliberate, examine, meditate. He never thought about his body being dead. Let me ask you, if God told you, and if you wanted a child when you were a hundred years old, Carly was mentioning that this morning. I, that's not something I'm believing for, praise God. <laughs> but if you wanted a child, if you'd been believing for it your whole life, and if God came to you and said, you're going to have a child this time next year, what would most of us do? We'd Google it. What's the oldest <laughs> that any person's ever had a child? <laughs> and we'd go check it out on the internet. And then we might, you know, go to the doctor and get checked out or have our wife checked out. You know, is it possible? Could she still have? And you accumulate all of this unbelief and then you've got this mountain of unbelief that says, no, it's impossible. It can't happen. Then you go back and say, God, are you sure about that? And he said, yes. And then you say, it's so hard to believe. Why is it hard to believe? Because you considered all of the other stuff that says, no, it can't happen. Abraham never considered his own body now dead. He never even, he, I'm sure he had the knowledge that he was a hundred years old and his wife had ceased to be with her after the manner of women. I'm sure that he had the facts, but that's not what he focused on. He wasn't considering it. He wasn't studying it. He wasn't pondering it. He wasn't examining it. But most of us, the first thing we do, if the doctor says you're going to die, man, we go research it and look it up and find out how long have I got to live? Uh, has anybody ever beat this? And you study all of these things and then wonder why it is that it's so hard to believe God. Man, I've got so much I'd love to say. I got a great series, Hardness of Heart. And one of the great points in it is Hebrews 11 verse 15 that says if they had been mindful of the country they came out of, they might have had opportunity to return. And for them, opportunity to go back to Ur of the Chaldees would have been unbelief, 
So it's saying that their unbelief, their temptation was linked to what they thought on. Here's another way of saying it. You can't be tempted with something you haven't thought. You have to go there in your mind before you go there in your body. It's like being in a tunnel. You can't just walk through dirt and rock. You got to hollow a place out and make a vacancy before you can enter in. That's the way it is. You got to go someplace in your mind first. You can't commit adultery without thinking adultery. You can't commit sin. You can't operate in unbelief without thinking things that produce unbelief. And again, most of us pay hundreds of dollars to have unbelief pumped into our house and listen to people talk about that and ridicule God and ridicule things and talk about how bad everything is. And we wonder why we struggle to believe God. Abraham, if you were to take Abraham and somehow or another just transport him in a time machine into your life, watching, listening, reading, thinking the way that you do, he wouldn't have been able to produce a seed any more than you are. But on the other hand, if you were to take you and transport you into his life so that every day at night and at day, day and night, so shall my seed be. And for 26 years, if that's all you thought, and then when God appeared to you, you didn't even consider anything else. You'd get the same results that Abraham got. Abraham didn't have greater faith. Your faith is greater than Abraham's. The problem isn't that we don't have faith. The problem is we got so much unbelief that counterbalances and negates our faith. Man, I, I've got another two hours in that little passage right there. But let me turn over to Hebrews chapter 11 and, and wind this thing up. I know that the heart can absorb more than the seat can endure. But here in Hebrews chapter 11, this is talking about Abraham again. As a matter of fact, I just read verse 15. It says, and truly, if they had been mindful of the country they came out of, they might have had opportunity to return. You can't be tempted with anything that you don't think. That's the reason the Lord told them, don't ever go back. And when Isaac was born and God, Abram wanted to go take a, a wife for him, he took his servant and he says, under no circumstances ever let my son go back to that area. They didn't go back. They didn't look at it. They didn't think about it. They burned their bridges behind them. That's the way you got to be with healing. You got to get to where I'm healed. I'm not considering anything else. And then it says in the next verse, in verse 16, but now they desire a better country. That is a heavenly where, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God for he hath prepared for them a city. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac and he that had received the promised seed or the promises offered up his only begotten son of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So this is talking about Genesis 22 when God told Abraham to sacrifice his son as an offering and it says, that's what it's talking about. And look at what it says right here in verse 19. Here's what he was thinking, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from whence also he received him in a figure. The New Testament says that what we have is greater than what any Old Testament man had. And so, so much greater that what they had has no glory compared to what we have. So Abraham was inferior to what I have. My faith, my covenant is so much greater than Abraham. And so based on that, I honestly sat down one time and tried to figure, God, would I have enough faith to literally sacrifice my son if you told me to do it? Now we live under a different covenant and God never intended this. He was just testing Abraham is what it says, uh, seeing if he was willing. Actually, I could go into a lot of detail but God can only do things on this earth to the degree that somebody yields and submits unto him. He doesn't move sovereignly. He doesn't move independent of us. Ephesians 3.20, now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think according to 
the power that works in us. If there's no power working in us, God can't do it. And I, per, I personally believe that the reason God wanted Abraham to be willing to offer his son is because until some person took that stance and believed God could not send his son into the earth. He had to have someone to flow through. And so anyway, that was a part of bringing Jesus. And it just so happened that the place that he was offering Isaac was Mount Moriah, exactly where the temple is and exactly where the Ark of the Covenant eventually stood and where the veil was rent in two. There was a lot of things going on here. So anyway, I was thinking, God, if what I've got is greater, could I sacrifice one of my sons? And you know what? I got to think, I got to imagining what it would be like to see the life drain out of your son and know that you were the one that killed him. And then I imagine when I went back home and Jamie said, where's Joshua or Peter? And I said, oh, I killed him. <laughs> I was imagining all of this stuff and I tried my best to say, Father, I believe. And I just had to say, Father, I couldn't, I can't imagine myself doing it. And then I saw this verse. You know why Abraham was able to do it? Because he never saw his son dead. It says he was accounting that God was going to raise him up even from the dead if he had to. He never saw Isaac dead because Isaac was the promised seed that would be produce children as numerous as the stars in the sky. And he wasn't married at this time. He hadn't produced a child. And so he had to live. Abraham was so focused on God. He had this vision so strong in front of him that if his son would have died, he figured God had raised him from the dead. He never saw his son dead. You know why you are struggling with things? Because you've seen yourself sick. You've accepted that diagnosis. You've seen other people who suffered with it. You've got that image of this is what's happening to me and you're conformed to it in your inside. And as a man thinks on the inside, so is he. I'm not saying this to condemn anybody. The Bible says we perish for a lack of knowledge. We're destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And most people don't know the things we're talking about. And so out of innocence, we've adopted the way the world thinks. But I'm telling you, you do not have to live that way. You can take the word of God and you can paint a picture on the inside of you. Of, of you being well and you having authority and power and you resisting the devil and he'll flee from you and you will have what you say and you can take all of these scriptures and you can meditate on them until those things come alive and you can become so pregnant with your healing that you just can't help but be healed. You know, when a woman gets pregnant, she's pregnant before she knows it. It takes a while for a woman to recognize she's pregnant. But then she recognizes some changes taking place. And so she knows she's pregnant before anybody else knows she's pregnant. But then after a while, everybody knows she's pregnant. It's beginning to show. And then eventually you deliver that child and people say, well, man, that was a quick delivery. It only took two hours or, you know, something like that. But no, it took nine months and two hours. And it was a process. And I'm telling you, if you'll get into the word and start doing the things we we're talking about, meditating in it, taking all of these truths, you'll get pregnant before you even realize it. You'll think, well, nothing's changed. I don't feel any different. But something's happening on the inside of you. And pretty soon you'll begin to start saying, you know what, I feel different. Instead of being hopeless and in despair, I've now got hope. I'm beginning to see this and you will see it. Nobody else will see it. But you keep meditating on it after a while. It'll become so real. People will say, when are you going to deliver? Man, you're like, you're ready to pop. And I guarantee you, you can get to a place where everybody can see that, man, you're believing God and they, they get faith because they see that you've got faith. But it's a process. And I'm telling you, it'll work for any person. Every one of you have this potential. The only thing that can stop this is if you aren't truly born again. Now, this will work to a degree if you aren't born again. But when you get born again, you become a brand new person in Christ. And God himself moves on the inside of you. And then the baptism of the Holy Spirit 
is when you receive this power. When you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the ability to pray in tongues, I tell you what, that moves you to a different level. So the only restrictions I'd put on this is you need to be born again. You need to have made Jesus your Lord, not just know about God, not just believe that he exists. It says in James chapter two, verse 19, you believe that there's one God, you do well. The devils also believe and tremble. But won't you know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. You've got to do more than just believe that he exists. You've got to yield your life to him. You've got to commit your life to him. And there's a lot of people that know about God, but they don't know God personally. When, when you experience God, you get changed on the inside. And you have God himself move on the inside. True salvation is not just an acknowledgement of something, but it's an experience. You acknowledge that Jesus is your Lord. You commit your life to him, but then you experience it and you become a brand new creature that never existed before. And if that hasn't happened to you, that needs to happen. And then once you get born again, Jesus told his disciples, don't go anywhere. Don't tell anybody. The greatest news in the world that Jesus rose from the dead and that he was the Messiah. Don't tell anybody until you receive power from on high. And when they received power, these men who had denied the Lord and ran in fear, all of a sudden they stood boldly before the very people who had crucified Jesus. And they said, you judge yourself which, who we ought to obey, whether you or God. And man, they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And it was just a few days later. What was the difference? The baptism of the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, it says in Romans chapter five, verse five, it says that this love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. The Holy Spirit will cause the love of God to just explode in your life. So every person in here needs salvation and needs the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Those are necessary things. And I don't want to let us go through this and just assume that everybody in here has those two things. You know, if you don't speak in tongues, you need to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I know that there's some people that are taught, well, I got the Holy Spirit when I got born again and that's, that's all I need. I'm not even going to go there and explain all of this. But I'm telling you, if you aren't speaking in tongues, you're missing out on the power of the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues is for us today. It is powerful. This building would not exist without speaking in tongues. I have spent thousands, tens of thousands of hours praying and conceiving and and the money that came in, we've spent $75 million in the last seven years debt-free on all of this. And it was through believing God. So I'm just telling you, somebody said, well, I'm not sure about that speaking in tongues. Well, then I, I am. Amen. If you aren't sure, trust somebody who is sure. I'm absolutely certain. Is there anybody in here that either isn't certain that you've committed your life to Jesus. I'm not saying you're a bad person. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but people think, well, I'm as good as this person. God's not going to grade you on a curve. It's not comparative to other people. You have to make Jesus your personal Lord. If there's anybody in here who's not certain that you've done that, I want to pray with you. And if you've already been born again, but if you don't speak in tongues, you need to experience that. Is there anybody in here who needs one or both of those and you want me to pray with you? If that's you, I want you to raise your hand right where you are so that I can see it. All over this auditorium. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Up there in the balcony. Man, that's awesome. That's awesome. You know, if you raised your hand or if you were supposed to raise your hand and didn't do it, would you get up out of your seat and come right down here and we want to pray with you and help you to receive here this evening. So if you raised your hand, just come forward right now and we're going to pray with you and man, this is going to change your life. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I know that there's many of you that have things you want to do, but would you wait just a moment so that these people that are coming forward can get down here without having people exiting? 
Let's give priority to these people. Man, this is a deal changer. This is a life changer. We need to support them in this. This is important. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Man, I don't know how you've made it this long without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues and Jesus being the Lord. I tell you what, I just don't know how people that don't know how to pray in tongues and have the Holy Spirit speak supernatural things to you, I don't know how you survive. And I'm sure some of you have had a rough time. This is going to change your life. This will totally, totally, totally transform your life. My life changed more through receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues than it did through getting born again. Now, being born again is essential, and it's the first step. I'm not minimizing that, but I'm talking about that was inward. When I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it changed me outwardly. This just transformed my life. Praise God. Boy, this is awesome. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. All right, before I can pray with you to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues, the Bible says that Jesus is the one who gives the Holy Spirit. So you have to receive the giver before you receive his gift. You have to make sure that Jesus is your personal Savior. And like I said during that invitation part, there's a lot of people who say, well, I believe in Jesus. Isn't that enough? The devils believe. You got to do more than just believe that he exists. You have to make him your personal Lord. He's already died for your sins. There is no question about will he forgive you? He's already paid for it. All it takes is you receiving it. And it says in Romans chapter 10, verse nine, that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. That's more than just saying that word. That's making Jesus your Lord. Turning your life over to Him. Saying, God, it's not my life anymore. It's yours. You're the Lord. Now, that's not a promise that you'll never sin or you'll never make a mistake because you can't live up to that. We all fall short of what we should be. But you have to be willing to make Him the Lord of your life. And it says, if you will confess Him as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes and with the mouth confession is made. Is there anybody here who's not certain that you've done that because you won't be able to receive the Holy Spirit until you receive Jesus who gives the Holy Spirit. So if you aren't sure, here's another way of saying this. If you were to die right this moment, do you know where you would go? Yeah. Some people say, well, I hope so. No, the Bible says that you have a witness in yourself and you know that you've passed from death unto life. If you're just hoping that God will accept you, that's not good enough. You got to make him Lord and then you will have a witness in yourself. Is there anybody here who's not absolutely certain that you've done that, that you've made Jesus your Lord? If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. Here's a lady right here. Anybody else? Here's a number of people. If that's you, raise your hand so I can see it. Here's another one. Here's one over here, other people. Here's some back here. Praise the Lord. Number of people here. Thank you, Jesus. Well, like I said, Jesus has already made the price. All you've got to do is receive. You don't have to say, God, will you forgive me my sins? He's already paid for them. Will you accept it? Will you make him Lord? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to lead you in a quick prayer and I'm going to ask everybody in here to pray this with me so that you won't feel like people are just listening to you. And I'm going to pray a prayer based on that scripture that I wrote, read you. And uh, it says, if you will confess Jesus is your Lord, you shall be saved. So if you will pray this prayer with me out loud and mean it from your heart, it's not magic, you have to believe it. But if you will believe this, you're going to become uh, instantly changed. Your insides are going to completely change. You're going to become a brand new person. Isn't that awesome? Man, that is the best deal you will ever get. So let's everybody say this. Say, Father, I'm sorry for my sin. I believe Jesus has already paid for my sins. And I receive that forgiveness. Jesus I, make you my Lord. Jesus, I make you my Lord. 
I believe that you are alive. That you now live in me. I am forgiven. I am saved. In Jesus' name. Amen. Do you believe that? Yes, sir. Do you believe that? Amen. Amen. You know, if you prayed that, and if you believe it, then according to the Bible, the Bible says, whosoever call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you believed it, you just now became a brand new person. You know, on the outside, you're still the same. If you were a woman, you're still a woman. If you were a man, you're still a man. And in your mind, you're still the same. You still got your thoughts, not my thoughts. You have to renew your mind. But there's a third part, that's the spirit. And in the spirit, you became a brand new person. And the dead part of you, the part that was driving you towards sin, the part that was by nature a child of the devil is gone. And you now have God himself, his seed on the inside of you. Man, that's awesome. And the Bible says, for the, all the rest of you, now everybody up here has prayed some prayer like that. The Bible says that you are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's significant because that means God created you to be a dwelling place for His Holy Spirit. So, this is what you were created for. God would not refuse a single one of you this baptism of the Holy Spirit. You were made for this. Some people think, but I'm not holy. I'm not living holy. I've got problems in my life. If you could get holy without the Holy Spirit, you wouldn't need the Holy Spirit. If you got sin in your life, you're the very one God is wanting to fill with the Holy Spirit to start giving you power so that you can overcome this. So don't let any sense of unworthiness or something stop you. The Bible says in Luke 11:13, 13, it says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? All you got to do is just ask and receive. So we're, I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. And we're just going to open up the doors of our temple and welcome the Holy Spirit to come in and say, Holy Spirit, we want your power in our life. And then we're going to start speaking in tongues because the Bible, in the Bible, when people receive the Holy Spirit, they spoke in tongues. And here's my last instruction before we pray. There's a lot of people that when it comes to speaking in tongues, they just open up their mouth and wait on God to make him talk. That's not how it works. It's very similar to how I taught tonight. I believe that God spoke through me. But if I would have said, oh God, don't let it be me. Let this be pure Holy Spirit. And I just opened up my mouth and waited on God to make me talk. You still wouldn't have heard a word. He didn't force me to say a thing I said. I spoke. It was me talking. But I believe it was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible says. They spoke with tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance or the inspiration. You have to speak just like I had to start speaking. That's the reason it came out in Texan. It came out with my sense of humor. It was me talking, but I believe it was inspired of God. Speaking in tongues is like that. He doesn't force you. The Holy Spirit doesn't speak in tongues. He inspires you and you have to start speaking. So we're going to pray a simple prayer. We're going to open up our heart, welcome the Holy Spirit to come. And then after we pray, I want you at that time to start thanking God that he gave you the Holy Spirit because he promised that he would. Take a step of faith, start thanking him. And then all of us who already have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we're going to pray in tongues. Because the Bible says that when you pray in tongues, you're giving thanks. So we're going to thank God for giving you the Holy Spirit. And as we start praying in tongues, I want you to start praying in tongues with us. Amen. And don't wait on the Holy Spirit to force you to do it. Start speaking something by faith. And it may sound weird at first, but anyway, I've got a book I'm going to give all of you. It'll explain the whole thing. Amen. Y'all ready? The Bible says believers will speak with new tongues. I want you to say, I'm a believer. And I will speak in tongues. Father, thank you for all of these. Thank you for these tonight that made Jesus their Lord. We believe that according to the word, now they are a brand new creature. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. And we believe that in our spirit, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
So Father, we open up the doors of our temple and Holy Spirit, we ask you to come fill us. You said you would give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. So we're asking right now for this infilling of the Holy Spirit and this gift of speaking in tongues. We ask and we believe that we receive right now in the name of Jesus. Now, I want you, just like when somebody sticks a gun in your back and you put your hands up, say, I surrender. This, this is, raise your hands. The Bible says when you lift up your hands in the sanctuary, you bless the Lord. So now start thanking Him that He gave you the Holy Spirit. Just out, of, out loud. Talk out loud. Thank you, Father, for giving me the Holy Spirit because you promised that you would. Thank you that I am God-possessed. That I have the power of the Holy Spirit living in me now in Jesus' name. And those of you who speak in tongues, let's start worshiping the Lord and giving thanks. And as we pray in tongues, you join in with us. Quit thanking Him in English and go to thanking Him in tongues. Thank you, Jesus. The Bible says that when you pray in tongues, you're giving thanks to God. You're bypassing the doubt in your brain and you're praying straight from your spirit. You got to open your mouth to pray in tongues. You can't pray in tongues with your mouth closed. The Bible says that you are edifying yourself. You're building yourself up on your most holy faith. Praying in tongues. Man, God's de delivering people. There's people being delivered and set free right now. Healing will come as you speak in tongues. If you need a healing in your body, just speak out. You're, you're releasing the Holy Spirit without the limitations of your mind. You're praying from your spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Man, that's powerful. Lots and lots and lots of these people are praying in tongues. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Let me have your attention here for a minute. Whether you spoke in tongues or not, you received the Holy Spirit because God said He'd give the